Okay. Sorry for the delay. It's been a busy Hi. day. No. Um, welcome uh, to this uh, Google Plus Hangout on uh, on Burundi. I'm Marie Lemensch. I'm assistant to the director here at MIGS and a uh, researcher as well. And this is my colleague. Hi, I'm uh, Noah Shwella. I'm a youth fellow at MIGS this summer. So why don't you introduce yourself a little bit, uh, Jeffrey? Okay, I'm uh, Jeff York. I'm the uh, Africa correspondent of the Globe and Mail. Uh, I'm based in Johannesburg, which is where I am now, but uh, I was just recently in Burundi uh, until last uh, Saturday. Excellent, thank you. Um, so I guess I'll just make some opening comments before we get into questions, if that's okay with you. Sure. Um, so after decades of civil war and ethnic unrest, um, Pierre Nkurunziza, the current president in his second term, has announced that he'll be uh, seeking a third term in office. And many people believe that since this is unconstitutional, uh, the strains in the political system could be too much for the fragile democracy to handle. Um, after having just gotten out 10 years ago of a civil war and with everyone of voting age um, still with vivid memories of political violence, there are fears that this could unravel into something much larger than what it has already. Um, with 70,000 uh, refugees having already fled the country, and houses being marked by youth, uh, by youth militias of the opposition to the president, um, it seems that uh, this is quickly getting out of hand. Um, in the last 24 hours, with uh, General Niambare having announced a coup against the president, who was in Tanzania at the time, um, it's still uncertain where this is going. Um, so many of our questions are going to sort of aim at looking at the role of the military, uh, civil society, and seeing what we can expect in the next few days and I guess leading up to the June 26th election. Um, yeah, so I guess we'll get started with the questions. So um, Jeffrey, you were there, as you said, you were there only a, a few days ago. Um, what was the atmosphere like at the time? Um, for example, what was um, what were the protests like? What was the role of the military? And uh, we also heard about youth militias. What were, what were their attitude in, the, in this? Well, when I was there, I mean, it's actually changed quite dramatically in the past 24 hours. But, um, but when I was there last week, um, the, the, the main uh, confrontation was between the protesters and the police. And the police were preventing the protesters from, from reaching the central Kojumbura. They were preventing the protesters from reaching the main government headquarters and, and the sort of the symbols of... Uh, power in, in Burundi um, and and because that was that happening the protesters were doing their best to push past but the police were resisting that with with uh, tear gas and also with live ammunition so we had at least a dozen protesters who were the and dozens or or maybe hundreds uh, wounded as a result of that that confrontation um, so uh, what what happened during that whole period was the army was basically taken at that, possibly because the army is much more integrated and represents, you know, Hutus and Tutsis, yeah. uh, the ruling party, all other parties. It is much more representative of the country than the police, which is more directly, uh, and, and the intelligence services, which are also loyal to the president. So uh, the protesters saw the army as being sort of a neutral force that was uh, uh, what's happened in the last 24 hours is that one faction of the army has stepped in and try uh, and announced a coup and uh, today the, the, the fight was for control of the state broadcaster which is one of the most important levers of power and symbols of power in Burundi uh, the last report just a few minutes ago is that the uh, loyalists to the president still controlled the the state broadcasting headquarters which meant that the it means that the, the coup may not succeed, or so far it has not, and it's quite a bad sign in terms of the danger of future violence because um, uh, what could happen now is the uh, forces, security forces, army, police, and so on that are loyal to the president could now try to uh, take revenge or, or root out uh, opposition by going after the protesters or other opposition forces, um, and there's been a lot of bloodshed already in the past 24 hours, and and we could see we could see a lot more in the days to come. Exactly. Um, so you had mentioned the military and that one faction is sort of leading the front. 
I wanted to ask what it sort of means that the military is the major opposition to um, Nikur and Ziza. In a sense, it seems a bit odd that the coup would happen now. In, while there was a lot of violence at the end of April, um, that could have been a good time for a coup. And then let's say that the president was trying to stop the elections in a few weeks' time. But now, um, with the president just announcing that he's searching or seeking a third term, can you sort of give us a bit of insight on what the military must be, um, and what their game plan is? Because they haven't been in talks, as far as I understand, with the UN or any other um, caretaker government that would be able to step in if the coup is successful. Well, first of all, you can't generalize about the army. The army is very, very divided. Uh, so there are, there are factions in the army that are loyal to the president, and there are factions that are, are not loyal to him. And I think those factions that are more independent of the president are those that have become very, very concerned about what's been happening. And they've seen shooting protesters, they've seen the protests continuing, and they know that uh, this is, is not something that will just uh, peter out or end by itself. So the army, those army who are independent of the president and probably critical of him, um, we're very concerned about the, 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 the likelihood of further violence and, and, uh, and bloodshed in you. So opposed to uh, the, the, the president is sort of assuming that he has the right to a third term uh, when there's a lot of constitutional advice that uh, that's a violation of the Constitution and the Arusha Accord that ended the Civil War. So that's why this faction in the army has, has acted. And the reason for the timing is simply that this is when the president was in Tanzania for this East African summit. So they seized the moment to try to act when he was out of the country. Um, so that's the explanation for the timing. Uh, but you're right, in some ways uh, it's, it's a bit late because the president has already announced that he's gonna be a candidate for this election on June 26th. On the other hand, it's not late because the international community is getting very involved right now. There's a lot of pressure on the president to postpone the election. Uh, it'll be very, very difficult for him to get any international support for the June 26th election. Uh, so in that sense, things are still very fluid right now. Um, in terms of, of, of the media, what, has, um, what kind of role has the media played in this? Um, because there are obviously government-owned media, but also private media, and some of them were, were shut down a few weeks ago, and I think they reopened yesterday um, during the coup. So what was... Uh, if, on the radio, for example, have you heard uh, any incitement of violence, any dangerous speech, or, uh, you know, um, as well, you know, the role of social media? Because I know um, the government tried to shut down access to, uh, to things like Twitter and Facebook. Yeah, the, the uh, independent radio stations are really the only source of independent information in, in, in Burundi, aside from social media. Um, the state broadcaster is not very well respected. It's very, very pro-president, of course, and it's not a neutral source of information. So people have a lot more trust or faith in the independent radio stations, and that's probably why um, RPA was the first target of, of, of the uh, police and the, the government in the early stages of the protests, and it was shut down. Now, it was reopened yesterday briefly, but now it's been attacked again, uh, mm -hmm. and it's again being destroyed and shut down. So. Uh, it just shows you that radio is crucial to information in Burundi. I mean, this is a, a very, very impoverished country, one of the poorest in the world. People mm -hmm. don't have uh, cable television or internet in their houses. They rely on radio, and they rely on their cell phones. And on their cell phones, they, if anyone has a smartphone, they have access to WhatsApp and other social media. Uh, but what's happened is the government has shut down, uh, you know, has basically forced the cell phone providers to stop, uh, to stop access to social media. And now people are using VPNs to get around that block. So basically, you know, not everyone has a VPN, not everyone has a smartphone. So really the most common source of information is radio. And that's why it has been the main target for the fighting in the last couple of days. Exactly. Right. And I guess in blocking many of uh, or these private radio stations that have been the source of information for uh, many individuals who don't live in, uh, in the capital, um, there seems to be a move to sort of uh, spread a sense of fear or intimidation. Um, I guess my question would be, to what extent can we sort of uh, be worried about um, the rising of ethnic tensions taking a, a play in this, um, given that um, it, 
Burundi is a country with a uh, history of ethnic violence as well as political violence. Yeah, that's, that's obviously a big worry. Uh, I mean, so far, um, it has to be said that the opposition to the president has been from both Hutus and Tutsis. It's a, it's a, uh, a multi-ethnic opposition. Uh, at the same time, um, you know, there is that legacy of ethnic conflict, civil war, and so on. And there's a fear that um, as the crisis grows worse, uh, the president and his loyalists uh, could play the ethnic card. Uh, they could use it as a way of mobilizing support, or they could portray it as an ethnic conflict, just as a way to mobilize support for themselves and, and uh, just as a way of uh, strategically trying to advance their cause. Um, and, you know, because that civil war is, was still fresh in people's memories, um, you know, th there is that uh, danger that it, it, those kind of tensions could arise again. And uh, that's certainly one of the big concerns that a lot of people have. It could be a bit of a tinderbox for the whole Great Lakes region, including, um, you know, Rwanda, Tanzania, the DRC, and so on. Mm -hmm. Um, do you see, uh, what, what is the opposition like? How, what are opposition parties like? Is there any unified voice? Let's say the coup works. Is there any alternative to to the president or to the current party? Yeah, they, they, they haven't formed, uh, they have not formed a united formal coalition uh, or a united political party, but it's, it, it's certainly safe to say that among the protesters, there are people from many different parties, from, from several different opposition parties. So in that sense, they are operating, to, operating together on the street. Um, and uh, so perhaps that's a hopeful sign uh, that they could, the opposition can work together. Um, having said that, um, you know, there are different strategies. I mean, in, in the last election, the opposition, most of the opposition boycotted the election. And it's not clear if, if, if some of them would still boycott this time if, if the election goes ahead. Um, so, you know, there are tactical differences of opinion. Uh, a number of candidates have put themselves forward officially as candidates for the presidential election. Um, and it's not clear to what extent people, you know, the opposition would unite around any one or two of those candidates uh, or whether it would be divided if there's an election. Right. I think we are, we're going to move no more towards the um, regional implications that you mentioned a few, uh, a, a few um seconds ago and, and the international role that Canada and, 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 and the UN could play. Yeah, so I guess I'll stay in the region for a little bit longer. With um, already 70,000 refugees having fled Burundi into countries like Rwanda, Uganda, uh, the DRC and Tanzania, what is sort of like the uh, humanitarian response that's going on right now in the region? And um, how are some of these countries coping with the influx of new population? Yeah, um, well, the UNHCR has has been working to help the refugees that go across the borders uh, and the UNHCR is is you know very active in Rwanda DRC and, and Tanzania so they're doing their best they say that so far it's not a humanitarian emergency but they're very worried that it could become one um, they, they've done contingency planning and under their contingency planning they've said that there could be as many as 300,000 people who need emergency assistance inside Burundi if the conflict uh, turns into the worst case scenario, which is sort of what 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 direction it's heading in now. And and w uh, one uh, one question that that interests me is um, perhaps more the um, response of of Rwanda and especially of President Kagame, who has a difficult kind of position in this. I think uh, not only is there this perhaps ethnic side to the conflict, but he is also thinking about running for a third term in Rwanda. So what have you heard from him? Is, has he reacted at all to the situation? Well, of course, he's been very critical of Burundi's president, who, who is not exactly a, a friend of his. Yeah. Um, at the same time, he is, uh, he's, he's not uh, criticizing the idea of running for a third term, even though that's the central issue in Burundi, because Kagame himself wants to run for a third term. He won't, he's not officially saying that yet, but it's clearly in the back of his mind and there's been this uh, huge number of people signing petitions in, in Rwanda to, to urge him to run for a third term. And I think most people expect that he probably will uh, mm -hmm. go for a third term, even if it requires uh, amending the constitution in Rwanda. 
So he's clearly uh, very, very involved in this. He's, you know, it's also true that he has got the toughest army uh, in the region uh, just across the border. And uh, if there's any regional cover, uh, regional support for this idea, he may be very tempted to send his troops across the border into Burundi on the pretext of stabilizing the situation. So that's something that we have to watch for to see if it happens. I mean, uh, you know, Rwanda, you know, Kagame definitely sees himself as a regional power broker, not just in Rwanda, but in the DRC and in, in Burundi. And um, he's not the kind of person who would just sit back and allow events to happen by themselves. Um, and uh, especially when he has been saying that, uh, uh, you know, the extremist Hutu rebels, the FTLR, could be uh, present in Burundi or could be coming across the border, could be a threat to Rwanda from Burundi. So he's been setting up this kind of pretext for his own involvement, perhaps under regional cover, if the situation in Burundi continues to deteriorate. Yeah, exactly. I was just going to ask about um, the Exodia FDLR and, and, and what role um, they might be playing. I think we had also a more like international question. Right. Um, so Kagana has been quite vocal about this. And I guess I was wondering what sort of you uh, think is the role of the international community, let's say Canada or Western Europe, uh, to sort of make a, a statement or to get more involved in uh, addressing the proceedings, especially since this is a country with uh, a history that um, Canada is well aware of, and that we know that there are questions um, about safety and humanitarianism. So what, like, where do you think the uh, Canada ought to play a role, or whether they're sort of failing in that? Well, um, I'm not going to say whether Canada should play a role. Um, it, it, it's, it's certainly true that Canada has been very low profile so far. It's put out a couple of statements recently. Um, and it has been, I think, critical of the third term, but then so has everyone, uh, United States, uh, European Union, African Union, and so on. So Canada is just maintaining solidarity with other Western governments on the third term issue. Um, when it comes to, uh, you know, the possibility of a peacekeeping force or, or something, I, I think everyone uh, prefers that to be a regional or, or continental force. Um, the problem is that if it's a regional force, uh, then you get a lot of self-interest involved. You get people like Kagami who clearly have a, a national self-interest uh, in, in, in Burundi, um, and uh, they may not be exactly neutral. Um, I think a lot of people say that it should be the African Union that gets involved, but they, you know, they do have a standby force uh, mm -hmm. that they've been talking about for a long time, but they have not really used it. Um, and, you know, almost always what happens is when there's an urgent crisis, the troops tend to come from the former colonials. Um, the African Union has been quite slow to, to actually mobilize a peacekeeping force. So we'll see what happens. I mean, this would be a very good opportunity for the AU to, to test its, its, its uh, standby force or its ability to... to to it for good in, in these kind of crises. Now, having said that, of course, it's too early to say that uh, intervention or peacekeeping force would be needed. I mean, we're still only six hours this coup and the fighting that's been taking place. So we'll see if if it gets resolved uh, in the next day or two, or if it turns into a more chronic, uh, bloodier, then, uh, then certainly, uh, you know, the everyone from the African Union to the United Nations will have to consider their options. Mm -hmm. And perhaps one final question that um, we want to ask: um, as, as a, uh, you've been covering the continent for quite a while, and it seems that we keep seeing kind of over and over leaders trying to hang out to power. But I think they're meeting a lot more opposition now from their people, from a civil society. Why do you think do they still, to this day and age, um, why do they still try to hold on to, to power and why do they think that they can get away with it? Well, I think multi-party democracy does not exactly have deep roots in many African countries. Um, there's, a, there's a legacy of war in many African countries and coups, uh, authoritarian governments, and um, a lot of leaders uh, obviously, you know, are tempted to hang on to power in that situation because they think they can do it. It's mm -hmm. really just that they think they can get away with it and people around them don't want to lose power and, and so they've become tempted to 
hang on by any means necessary. But I think you, you're correct to say that the situation is shifting. There's less, I think, tolerance by, you know, populations, uh, ordinary people in many African countries. Uh, you know, we've seen some very dramatic um, improvements in the situation in, in terms of democracy in, in many African countries in the past few years. We saw uh, a president in Senegal try to get a third term and he was defeated. We saw um, Nigeria where a very strong incumbent ruling party was just defeated in, in this very recent election. Uh, for the first time ever, there was a peaceful handover of power after an election in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. uh, we see in Burkina Faso where people rose up and toppled a, a strong military government a military regime after I think 25 years. So, um, and then we, we did see the Arab Spring earlier and, and there's been a lot of resistance to, to a number of uh, strongmen, authoritarian rulers across Africa. Now, in a number of countries, um, it'll be very, very difficult to dislodge uh, leaders. Uh, I mean, there's a number of, uh, you know, authoritarian leaders in Africa who are very powerful and the opposition does not have very many levers against them for a variety of reasons. But we are seeing shifts in some places like Burundi, I think DRC, there was protests in Kinshasa uh, recently, um, Burkina Faso, Senegal, we're seeing a number of countries where people are, are not sort of blindly accepting uh, leaders hanging on to power. Yeah, we still see uh, Mugabe in Zimbabwe and then we look at Gabon as well where leaders st still hang on to power. Uh, well, thank you very much for joining us today. Are you going back to uh, Are you going to Burundi soon? Do you know? I don't know yet. Sorry, it, and of course, yeah. right now the, the airport is uh, difficult to get into. Well, thank you very much for uh, for joining us today, and um, best of luck in in Johannesburg. And uh, we hope to be able to talk to you soon. And I'm sure people will be very interested in knowing what's happening because I was looking at the news last night, uh, the, the the Canadian news. We had basically. 30 seconds, 30 seconds about uh, the situation in Burundi, and it was about uh, by the end of, 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 of the news program. So I don't think a lot of people know what's going on, and we want to uh, have a long discussion about this. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Bye. Okay.